thank you, Ken. This is, uh, it, can you hear me in the back? OK, great. Uh, this is uh, reciprocal. We had, as Ken mentioned, he visited uh, Harbor Branch Oceanographic a couple of months ago, and he was one of our distinguished seminar speakers. Uh, so people have been very excited about the potential for working together. And a group of our faculty are coming up to visit uh, in the next couple of months uh, to look at some joint collaborations. So that will be very exciting. What I'd like to talk to you about today are some examples of the ways that the ocean is changing and some things that we've been very surprised to discover in the last maybe 10 years or so about the ocean and uh, what, what the implications of that are for all of us who live here close to the ocean or even live in the interior where the ocean has a lot more effect than they might think. So the oceans are one of the most dynamic environments on Earth. Uh, and while they have been very different in the past, as I said, we've been very surprised to find that they're changing very rapidly at a rate that exceeds the, uh, the rates of change in the past. And much ocean research today is focused on understanding these changes and developing ways to adapt to these changes if possible. So the ocean is about 4 billion years old. It originated from the gases that came out of volcanoes in the, uh, the time of the early Earth. Those contained water vapor, and that water vapor eventually formed the oceans. So four billion years old. During, and three billion years ago, there was a major change in the ocean because for the first billion years, the oceans contained no oxygen dissolved in them. Obviously, water is H2O, and it has oxygen bound in it. But there was no dissolved oxygen in the ocean, and there wasn't, in the there wasn't any in the atmosphere either. None at all. But the oceans were teeming with life. They were teeming with microbial life, microbes that make their living by using other energy sources than oxygen. So they've been very, very different. In fact, microbiologists often refer to that as the great oxygen catastrophe. Uh, of course, they, weren't, they aren't thinking in the same terms that we are. A little more recently, about 600 to 800 million years ago, uh, we think that much of the ocean was covered with ice and snow. We call it the snowball earth. And there were places that were, were clear of ice, but, but it was a very, very different ocean from today. And yet, that ocean, too, had a lot of life in it. It certainly wasn't dead as a result of being covered with ice. Sort of at the opposite extreme, about 85 million years ago, we know that there were warm-blooded animals, crocodiles, uh, crocodile ancestors, living on the shores of the Arctic Ocean, and that the Arctic Ocean was still uh, where it is now, at the poles. So a very warm water ocean, very different from today. So much of our research over the last 20 years suggests that the ocean is changing very rapidly. So given the, these very different oceans that we've had in the past, why are we worried about that? The reason is that our civilization originated with the ocean that we have today. It originated during a time of fairly uh, constant climate. And much of it, as you know from those of you who, who study history or who look at history as armchair historians, know that many of those uh, original civilizations were close to the ocean. Our particular economy evolved in the last 150 years or so. So our coastal cities, uh, the places where we, uh, where we have agriculture are dependent on the ocean as it is today and as it has, has evolved. So if it's changing rapidly, what does that mean for our future? So give you an example. 
the ocean is linked directly to the growth of food on continents everywhere. And this is a wonderful little movie loop that I'll, uh, it's going to go around and I'll, I'll tell you about it while, while it's going on. And it represents the time period from the early 80s until the late 90s. So it's about 15, 17 years in length uh, and it'll, it'll go uh, cycle around. And of course, if you focus on the continents, you'll see that they're sort of varying between green and brown. And the colors are me measuring the density of, of vegetation. So it's not just whether there are leaves on the trees or not, but also the density. So when it's brown, it's not just that there are no leaves, it's that, uh, that there's less foliage. The, the ocean colors are reflecting the temperature of the oceans. So red for warm, blue for cool. And one of the, the most prominent features is this big line that you see across the equatorial Pacific. And that, of course, is the signature of El Nino. When it's, when it's red, when it's warm, the equatorial Pacific uh, is going through a, a warm temperature anomaly. That's El Nino. And when it's blue, when it's dark blue and it's cold, that's La Nina. And many of you may realize that uh, El Nino times are associated with tremendous rainfall in areas like California, in areas uh, in, in some of the coastal regions uh, of South America, and they're associated with droughts in, in um, Australia. So these big ocean features affect the hydrographic cycle, affect rainfall, affect uh, crops and vegetation. Uh, some more subtle examples are here in the Atlantic, where when you see a big blue anomaly here, you'll see it followed very quickly by drought downstream uh, in Brazil. So the temperature of the South Atlantic is actually affecting uh, the vegetation of Brazil. So that's why I said even out here in the middle of the country, we're very dependent on what's happening with the oceans. So our, again, our agriculture uh, and, and uh, our uh, forestry and so forth, very dependent on the oceans that we have now. And again, the changes that we see are happening more rapidly than they did in the geologic past. The real heroes of this story are the people who go to sea and have been collecting, not only understanding processes, but collecting data over time so we can see how things are changing, whether that's using human-occupied submersibles, uh, like our Johnson Sea Link from Harbor Branch, or uh, samples, samplers that uh, collect water from uh, the depths of the ocean, or that collect uh, the, the, uh, the dead organisms that are sinking down in the ocean, or samplers like this big metal tube that, are, that we put vertically lower to the bottom of the ocean and collect sediment samples that tell us about the history of the ocean. These are just a few of many, many kinds of sampling tools that we use to, to determine uh, what's been happening. So I'd like to tell you a little bit, tell you a few stories about uh, four particular changes that we have become more aware of in the last few years and that are of great concern to us. So changes that, that we worry about. The first one of those is ocean acidification. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Now, uh, many people may have seen uh, this graph, which is the record of CO2 in the atmosphere uh, for as long as we've been keeping records of it, since about 1957. Uh, this particular record is from Mauna Loa in Hawaii, but there are seven other places uh, around the globe that we, we uh, measure CO2, and they also have similar, uh, similar records. And, we, uh, and this CO2 is added primarily by our burning of fossil fuels, and the CO2 concentration has gone up. And 
We're not going to talk about global warming. That's a different issue. This is uh, what happens as a result of just the CO2. About one quarter of that CO2, 26% of our emissions, dissolve in the ocean. And there are two processes that, that cause them to dissolve. One is just uh, physical exchange. Waves and tides and, and wind mix the CO2 into the ocean. The other is that organisms that are photosynthetic, well, microscopic plants, take up CO2, make their organic material out of it. When they die and sink, that CO2 in the form of organic material is sequestered in the ocean. So this has a very sizable effect on the chemistry and the biology of the ocean. One of those effects has to do with the pH. So if you drink soft drinks, uh, your soft drink is fizzy because it has CO2 dissolved in it. The CO2 also makes it acidic. And we measure acidity on a scale that's called pH. And pH goes from 0 to 14. 0 is really acid. And 14 is really basic or really alkaline. And neutral is 7. And it's a logarithmic scale. So 8 is 10 times more uh, more alkaline than seven, and nine is 10 times more alkaline than eight. Your soft drink is about pH 2.5, so it's, it's acid. And you, when I was a little girl, uh, I, I grew up and my father would say that if something was rusty, you put it in, in Coca-Cola and it would dissolve the rust, and it does. And that's because it's acid. Uh, vinegar is a little less acid. Uh, most vinegar is a little less acid, and lemon juice is a little bit more acid. So that gives you a, an idea. Uh, CO2 dissolving in water makes it more, more acidic. The ocean pH has been about 8 or 8.2, uh, more or less in that area, for a very long time. And we have ways of measuring uh, components of the shells of microscopic organisms that have been deposited in the past that allow us to understand what the pH of the ocean was. And this little graph goes from present day into the past. This is 25 million years ago. And you can see that the pH of the ocean, there's 8, 8.2, 8.4. So it's sort of bounced around there. Uh, but the changes have been fairly, you know, they were taking place over millions of years. So here we are today. And when we've been measuring CO2 in the atmosphere, we also started measuring a, a long time series of, PA, of uh, CO2 in the ocean. So this is CO2 in the ocean measured about 200 miles off Hawaii. Uh, and we've only been doing that since about 1990. And you can see that as the CO2 goes up in the atmosphere, it goes up in the ocean, and this light blue is pH. So pH has been going down. Uh, well, it's gone down, you know, measurably. If we look at what we know from just basic physics and chemistry, how long it will take for the CO2 that's presently in the atmosphere to dissolve into the oceans. And just from the, that very basic knowledge of the way uh, you know, the way CO2 dissolves in your soda water and so forth, we know that to take up the CO2 that's currently in the atmosphere will take hundreds of years, and that by 2100, the pH of the ocean will have gone down substantially. And this is substantially in relation to what it's been for millions of years. So what? Many organisms in the ocean make skeletal material out of calcium carbonate, chalk. Uh, actually, many of them make it out of a different mineral, uh, uh, aragonite, uh, which is also calcium carbonate. And they depend on a certain concentration of aragonite in the water so that they can make their shelly material. And this is a map of what the aragonite saturation 
uh, was. Back at the beginning of the, uh, about the time this, this country was founded, 1765. And again, we know that from understanding measurements of, of fossil organisms. And the red areas and orange areas are areas that are optimal for corals. The green are marginal and blue are, there's not enough aragonite for corals to make their skeletal materials. So there are no corals at high latitude, partly because of temperature, but also partly because of the saturation of aragonite. So that's the way things looked a couple hundred years ago. This is that same map for 1765. This is the way things looked in 1995. All of the little black dots here, the little zits, on the ocean are coral reefs. Here's the projection for 2040. And again, this is just based on the CO2 that's in the atmosphere and the equilibration of that. And here's the situation for 2100. And what you see is that just that small change in pH is enough to really affect the saturation of this critical component for corals. So one of the things we're concerned about is whether we'll have these by the end of the century. Now there are other things that make uh, their skeletal material out of calcium carbonate or aragonite. Um, these little organisms are microscopic marine snails. They're about a millimeter across, and they're called pteropods. And they also make shells out of calcium carbonate. And they're an important part of the food chain in many marine ecosystems. And one of the ways that we first sort of turned on to this idea of the impact of uh, ocean acidification was that we found that pteropods in the North Atlantic were starting to have shells that were already eroded or corroded by acidification. And they were kind of deformed. And as we studied that more, we realized that it was a result of the acidification, that slight acidification of the oceans. Another example, these little footballs here, or baseballs, are microscopic shells of phytoplankton. Um, photosynthesizing organisms that, uh, that live in the ocean. And when there's low CO2 in the atmosphere, they make nice little uh, baseballs. As the CO2 gets higher and higher, they have more and more trouble doing that. So this is an example of another kind of organism near the base of the food chain. So one of the things that we're very concerned about is our lack of understanding about how the CO2 going into the atmosphere affects phytoplankton, little baseballs, zooplankton, the little snails, and how that affects the rest of the food chain. So here, uh, again, it's only been about 10 to 12 years that we've understood the nature of this problem and that we've been able to, to project into the future just based on, on chemistry and physics uh, what would happen. Now, I don't want to leave you with the impression that everything is going to crash and burn. Sea urchins actually like it a little bit more acidic. They reproduce better. So the magnitude of our lack of understanding about this is one of the things that we're very concerned about. So let's talk about another thing that we're concerned about, and that's warming oceans. So if we, um, if we took a, a satellite picture of the temperature uh, of the uh, oceans, this, this happens to be the weekly average for uh, the beginning of, of uh, February last year. Um, and obviously, you know, it's cold at the poles and warm at the equator, but that's really the skin surface of the ocean. For uh, the last 40 years or so, we've been using a variety of techniques 
to understand the integrated temperature of the upper, whole upper part of the ocean, the upper, say, 2,000 feet or so, 700 meters. And uh, those of you who uh, remember back to your high school chemistry will remember that water has incredible heat capacity. It takes more energy to heat up this bottle of water than it would to heat up uh, for example, a similar volume of a metal. Uh, it has tremendous heat capacity, and so it holds heat very well. And this little chart goes from 1970 to 2010, and it's several different uh, ways of integrating the information that we have about the upper, the temperature, the heat content of the upper part of the ocean. But all of those are in agreement that the heat content is rising. The ocean has been warming since we started measuring its heat, the, the integrated heat content about 40 years ago. Florida coastal waters, uh, it, in some areas, are up to 5 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than they were 30 years ago. So what happens with warmer waters? We're going to talk about two uh, effects. One is. Um, you know, what happens to, to areas that warm up at the poles. So we've been looking at the, the uh, Arctic Ocean from satellites for uh, about 35, 40 years. And this is uh, an image of what the annual sea ice minimum during the end, at the end of the summer, looked like in 1979. <coughs> Here's what it looked like in 2007. Now, it's variable. Not, you know, it bounces around a lot. But here's the minimum sea ice extent at the, the height of the summer minimum. That's September from back in the late 70s when we first started gathering this data till today. Now, it was 2007, so I, I chose you know, the most extreme. But you can see that uh, it's a steady decline. So this is, uh, and, and of course, one of the things that we understand, well, let me go back. Let's see if I can go back. There we go. Um, even though this is a graphic, not a photograph, uh, the, the sea ice is white or very light, and the ocean is dark colored. So when you have less ice, the, heat, the ocean can absorb more heat. More is taken up by the ocean, and less is reflected back into space by the, the white area. So this is what we call a feedback loop, too. The more ice we melt during the summer, the, l the less the extent of sea ice the more the Arctic Ocean can warm. Now, the Arctic isn't going to be ice-free during the winter. We still are a planet with a North Pole, and it's still cold in the winter there. It's the summer that, that seems to be very sensitive. And now what I'm going to tell you a concern about is a very different kind of, of thing. This doesn't have to do with phytoplankton or zooplankton or corals or any uh, organisms. It has to do with us and the way that we uh, interact. The, the governing group for the Arctic is the Arctic Council. And the Arctic Council is made up of all of the countries that own land on the Arctic Ocean. So uh, they're the dark coral color here is, so we're looking from, uh, at the North Pole. There's the North Pole. There's Russia. And this lighter color is all the water that Russia claims. Here's Norway and all of the water areas that Norway claims. It can go up here because it's got Spitsbergen. Uh, here's Iceland. Greenland, which is owned by Denmark. So this is sort of Denmark. There's Canada. And here's Alaska. And so we, we have a piece of the Arctic 
uh, as a result of Alaska. And then there are all kinds of areas that are disputed and so forth. But the Arctic deals with territorial claims. It deals with issues of mineral rights, um, who gets to drill in areas that aren't specifically uh, owned, um, fisheries in those areas, if there were any. Uh, and the Arctic Council, again, is just the countries that own land. But there are observers. And the observers are in the room because they want to influence the discussion. So there are some permanent observers. The EU is a permanent observer. Denmark, Norway, Sweden. Are, uh, Sweden's a permanent observer because although it doesn't have uh, a coast on the, the Arctic, it, it's up there. It's very important. So I, I flipped ahead uh, accidentally, so you know the answer to that question. Who has applied for permanent observer status in the Arctic Council? China and South Korea. <laughs> Why? They're not anywhere near the Arctic. Uh, it's because this, is, this would be uh, uh, the shortest trade route to Europe. And so those countries are already planning for, uh, for marine transport trade through the Arctic. And that, of course, raises all kinds of issues. Safety, governance, um, uh, you know, who, who gets to, uh, it opens up questions of fisheries, uh, fisheries in, in the area that isn't claimed by uh, the countries that are here. And this is so big a political issue that our US military has identified it as the issue that they think will be the biggest geopolitical change over the next century in terms of what, they, what the, the Navy has to deal with uh, and territorial uh, changes. So a very different kind of impact of a very rapid change in, uh, in the oceans. Sea level rise. So we talked a little bit about warming and its effect on melting ice. Warming also warms up the ocean. And if you, if you had uh, a glass of cold water that you filled it all the way to the brim and it was cold, and then you started heating it, even before it boiled, it would, it would expand and it would, uh, it, and it would run over the edge of the glass because water has, is, occupies more space when it's warm than when it's cold. So as now you know that the upper 700 meters of the ocean are warming, so it's expanding. And part of what we see of, in sea level rise is a result of that expansion. Uh, and then some of it is a result of melting snow and ice on land. So the global average sea level rise since 1800 is about two feet, uh, 24 centimeters. Sea level rise for Pensacola is currently two millimeters a year, or about eight inches a century. But the rate is increasing. So this is the 1880s to 2000, and you can see that it was sort of, you know, this was, that's 1.7, so this was sort of more around one, and then two, and now it's about three. Part of this is, it can be explained by the warming, and part is a result of melting of, of glaciers on land. Now, all that ice in the Arctic doesn't affect sea level because it's floating ice. Just like uh, if, if you had that glass of water and you had ice cubes in it and it was full to the very brim, even if the ice cubes melted, it wouldn't overflow because they're balanced. So ice on water doesn't affect sea level, but ice on land does. And this is just one example of many, I could show you, of glaciers on land that are retreating very <laughs> rapidly. This, this happens to be the ice cap in the Andes uh, above Lima, Peru. And here's, this is the glacier. Uh, this, and you're looking at it from a hill up here. Here's 
the side of a, the hill. Here's a little spur of land that sticks out into the glacier. And this was from 1978. This is a picture from 2000 from exactly the same location. And you can see how far the glacier has retreated. That is, being, that is happening everywhere except some areas of the Himalayas uh, around the Earth. So the snows of Kilimanjaro are no more. The, the glacier that is on Kilimanjaro is sort of about the size of this room. Uh, not like the pictures uh, and the, uh, uh, the, the ice that was there when uh, Hemingway wrote his story. Um, the uh, Himalayas are different because the, you know, the, the ice cap depends on two things. It depends on how much is melting, but also how much is coming in. And the changing hydrologic cycle is bringing more snow to certain areas of the Himalayas. So it's still melting, but it's being replaced. In areas like this, uh, it's just melting away. This, this, uh, the river that comes out of this ice cap happens to be the main source of water for the city of Lima, Peru, seven million people. So that combination of melting of glaciers on land and, uh, and the expansion of the ocean is resulting in the sea level rise. Here's another, uh, the two big places where, where ice is stored on land are Greenland and Antarctica. And here's an example from Greenland. And this is based, again, on satellite measurements of where the, where the ice is melting. And this pink color is all of the areas that were um, the, the melt extent, how far up into the, the coldest, thickest part of the glacier, melting was happening in 1992. The red is how far melting is extending in 2006, just in, what's that, 14 years. This little graphic is the maximum extent of summer ice melt in Greenland from 1978 to 2010. And obviously, it's bouncing up and down a lot. But the, the key message is that the melting is increasing. And all of the evidence we have from Greenland suggests that the overall rate of melting is increasing steadily. This particular kind of information about sea level rise and what's happening in the ocean is really very, our understanding of this is, is very recent. For example, in 2007, there was a major report, an assessment uh, of climate and change of this sort that included an estimate of sea level rise. And the scientists had so little data and understanding of what was happening here that they decided that they would only base their, their estimate of sea level rise on that thermal expansion uh, because there was so much uncertainty. A new report will be coming out in another year. And already, uh, we know what the answer is going to be uh, because they have so much more knowledge of the melting of glaciers and the melting of ice on Greenland. And the minimum. Uh, sea level rise that's being projected globally is two feet by the end of the century. Okay, so you know our area. I used to look, live up in the mid continent, and you know sea level rise was somewhere else, and now I live down here. Uh, it's not quite as bad as Miami or uh, here in New Orleans, but we're we're really the this area is the one that will feel sea level rise the most. This is a map of uh, the red would be a meter and a half. That would be about five feet of sea level rise. So nobody's saying that that's the, the estimate for the end of the century. Uh, but it might be the estimate in a couple of centuries. And remember, that's, that's based on just extrapolating what we already know. And the thing that we're very concerned about is that issue of 
feedback. If melting starts, will it speed up even more? Uh, even, if we, even if we talk about that two or three feet uh, number that's being projected for the end of the century, uh, although Florida ranks second to Louisiana in the area that would be submerged at either two or three feet of sea level rise, because of our population and the number of homes, our, the, the impact in Florida would be much greater than in Louisiana. 40% of the first foot of sea level rise, 40% of the economic impact of the first foot of sea level rise is in Florida, mostly South Florida. 70% of the first two feet is in Florida. We are really ground zero for this problem. And here's a little, uh, that's sort of putting that into, uh, instead of just drawing the, you know, the Gulf in Florida like it was a cartoon, here's a real image of it. And they've, they've allowed sea level to, this, this shows three feet of sea level rise. And so it kind of comes in, this is the Florida, uh, the high uh, ridge uh, that comes down the east coast. And sea level rises around here. And one of, and it's not just sea level rise in Florida. Remember, the whole peninsula is a big, essentially like a concrete sponge. It's very porous. It used to be coral. Uh, you know, it's essentially fossil coral. And when sea level rises, it not only comes up the outside, but it pushes the fresh water up and out. So it's a double problem, submergence and also loss of fresh water. Um, people in South Florida take this very seriously. Fort Lauderdale now, streets that were once clear during storm surge are now routinely flooded with storm surge. Pensacola's risk of four feet flooding, four feet storm surge routinely by 2030 has increased by 85% due to, to, due to um, what we know about sea level rise and the risk of five foot flooding by 25, 2050, whoops, that should be, has increased by 93%. So it's not just submergence, it's also what happens when you have storm surge with slightly higher sea level. Totally different kind of problem, fisheries decline. Uh, what this shows is uh, during the 50s, 60s, up to the 90s, uh, this is the portion of the fisheries, so this is 100% of the fisheries that were underexploited. This is the portion that's fully exploited. This is overexploited, and this is crashed. So in 1950, 15% of fish stocks were harvested to their maximum sustainable levels. So that's fully exploited. There wasn't anything that had crashed. There wasn't anything overexploited. That's 1950s. So a lot of people in this room, including me, can remember that. In 2003, 32% of the stocks had crashed uh, to the point that even if we stopped fishing, we aren't sure that they would come back. 39% are overfished. The remaining 29% are at the limit of sustainability. And we don't have any real fisheries for species that we like to eat that are underexploited. This little graphic shows um, the, the harvests for the main fishing countries and the amount that is in aquaculture. So aquaculture has become a big industry and a big part of this equation. 
And one of the things that's a real concern here is that most aquacultured species are grown using fish. So we catch fish, fish that we don't want to eat. We dry it and grind it up, turn it into fish meal, and feed it to fish that we do want to eat, like salmon and catfish and other things that are aquacultured. So the red here, and this is 1980 to 2005 or so, the red is the fish supply from capture fisheries. So it's varied, but it certainly hasn't gone up. That's the population. And this is the fish supply from aquaculture. So aquaculture is, in 2005, was more than 50% of the fish that was consumed. And most of that is grown on fish. This is the uh, production, the, cap, the, the catch of fish that are turned into fish meal. And of course, the thing that people worry about is, look what's happened in the last 20 years or so. So we're sustaining people's desire for, uh, for fish protein with aquaculture, but we're doing it with something that's also uh, a problem, with fish meal. This year was the first year that China's importation of, of seafood, whether aquacultured or wild harvest, was greater than its export. And China is the number one uh, wild harvest capture fishery in the world. And that's not only the population growth, but the growth uh, of wealth, or the, the growing wealth of China. So people can afford to buy more fish than they did before. There's a great demand for protein, and it is putting increasing pressure on, on uh, fishing and on aquaculture. So that all looks, you know, th those are kind of uh, four uh, stories uh, that certainly raise a lot of worry. And they're all things you saw that all of those were things where in the last 40 years or so, we've seen dramatic changes, faster than natural rates of change. And in many of these areas, like sea level rise, like acidification, we really didn't have the information before, about 10 years or so ago, to, call, to, to say that this was a problem. So these are, are new problems for oceanographers to grapple with. So what are we optimistic about? I think the first, when it comes to corals, uh, uh, there's a tremendous investment now in understanding the vulnerability of corals mm -hmm. to acidification and what's happening with that. And to give you an example of uh, how this, this lack of information uh, plays out, one of the big coral diseases in the Keys and around Florida is called black line disease. And it's a bacterial disease. And, and uh, the, the border between the dead coral and the live coral is a black line. So it's called black line disease. One of the things that we found is that the organism that causes black line disease is more susceptible to acidification than the coral is. So as the acidification has increased, the, you know, in all of our laboratory experiments, and to some degree we might be seeing it in the field, uh, it seems as though that might be a good news story. So if we can keep the corals less, uh, 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 um, you know, uh, resilient to the acidification themselves, there might be some, some good news stories. I already told you uh, sea urchins seem to, to like it a little bit more acid. So it's really here that uh, our understanding about what will happen uh, is, is key to understanding whether uh, which areas are vulnerable, whether they're all uh, the same. Are the, are the coral reefs of Australia as uh, equally vulnerable to those in, uh, uh, in the Keys or off Brazil? Uh, 
are all of the are all of the species of those little marine snails equally vulnerable, or are there some that are going to be just fine? Or if they all died, you know, is something else going to occupy that niche and take take advantage of all the food that's available? Those are questions that we don't uh, know the answer to, but that are really at the heart of uh, tremendous research now, and our understanding just in the last three to four years of what's happening is already growing. And so I'm very optimistic that we will come to understand this a lot better. Five years from now, when somebody gives this talk, they'll be able to tell you a lot more about what, what's really vulnerable and what's not. Aquaculture, the key to to what, what uh, aquaculture research in places like Harbor Branch and, and other uh, US uh, universities that study aquaculture is how can we get away from using fish meal and fish oil uh, to, grow the, uh, to grow the fish. And that's uh, uh, pompano from, uh, we, we aquacultured pompano at, uh, uh, at Harbor Branch. And we aquaculture it on land in tanks and we feed the, the uh, pompano until the last two weeks of their life, not fish meal, but soy meal. They grow, they're, they're perfectly fine with that. It's important to feed them fish meal or fish oil for the last two weeks or they don't really taste like fish. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, being, I'm being a little extreme. They taste like fish, but they, they don't really taste the same. But you know, if you can if you can feed the pompano for several months on on soybean and then feed it uh, fish meal at the end, and it still is an acceptable product, we've come a long way toward uh, toward dealing with that. Another really uh, interesting thing that's happening is that uh, we're dis we're looking at what's called multi-trophic aquaculture. That's growing more than one species in the same system, not in the same tank, but in tanks that are connected. So you have one species like this that you're actually feeding, and then all of the waste from the pompano goes to feed the clams and, uh, uh, and the oysters, because that's what they feed on uh, out in the wild. They feed on the organic material that's the waste product of other species. So you put uh, clams or oysters or, or, or species in the same system, and they use that. And then what do the clams and the oysters and everything do? They excrete nutrients, dissolved nutrients, like nitrate and phosphate. And what lives on those? Seaweed, uh, which is another uh, important uh, uh, species, whether it's uh, seaweed for, um, for sushi or whether it's seaweed uh, that's used uh, to, as meal, as, uh, as protein, and as uh, uh, a fish meal substitute. So a lot of really very interesting work on uh, being able to replace seafood protein with other, with other uh, in, in more sustainable ways. Uh, other examples of, uh, of what we're doing. Uh, working with the University of Florida, we've developed a strain of hard clams for aquaculture that are resistant to warmer temperatures uh, and the warmer temperatures that we're experiencing in coastal Florida. So originally, uh, this project was meant to uh, provide a, a way for fishermen who were excluded from net, uh, net take uh, on the, the west coast of Florida uh, and to give them an option of, of going into aquaculture. And then we found that these clams uh, as in the Cedar Key area and other areas that are experiencing periodic, very warm waters are resistant to those warm waters. So the aquacultured um, species make it through fine while the others don't. So there are many things that we're, we're looking at that, that uh, might allow us to, uh, uh, and these are, these are uh, hybrids, so it's not genetic modification. They're just bred uh, for, uh, for greater resilience. Another example, this wonderful little video, um, it, the, the white 
the lines here indicate the currents and the current strength uh, in the ocean. And up here you see the, uh, the, the extension of the Gulf Stream and, and the area uh, of the North Atlantic. And look at down here across Florida, one of the most uh, strong currents uh, compared to what's going on in, in the North Atlantic. When, when you confine uh, a flow of water or air to a narrow area, what happens? It goes faster. And that's what's happening in the Florida current. We have a very fast moving current. The Florida current has the strength of a gale force wind. And so one of the things that's being done uh, that is going on at my university is research on uh, generating energy from uh, the current in the Florida current by experimenting with putting turbines in the, the water. So this is still a research project. Nobody's generating energy like, uh, from this. But the idea would be to submerge uh, turbines in the, the heart of the, the Florida current. The current turns the turbine blades. They would be connected to, um, to uh, lines that would carry the, the electrical energy generated by this onto land. If we were to be able to harvest 5% of the current energy of the Florida current. We wouldn't be stopping the Florida current. Uh, it would still be, uh, would still be uh, flowing very vigorously. That would be the equivalent of the three largest nuclear power plants in Florida. That's, it's not going to replace gasoline, but it could be uh, a, a, a renewable and uh, a very um, desirable form of energy. Um, this is still a research project, and what this is showing is uh, a, uh, a buoy, a, a monitoring buoy, uh, that's going to be deployed uh, in the Florida current. And then ships would bring out test equipment like this turbine, uh, hook up to the buoy where we have, where we're recording information about the Florida current and the conditions there, just to get to the point where we could have a permit to do the research required two years of environmental impact work. So nobody's going to just go out and do this. Um, and everything from the effect on sea turtles to the effect on corals and, and so forth. Uh, so it's still a research uh, idea, but I think it's a very interesting one. And uh, uh, these kinds of ideas about how to use the ocean more effectively are really important. Finally, the last thing that really makes me optimistic is how much people are learning about the ocean and how much everybody is, understands about the ocean now compared to when I was a little girl. Uh, wonderful uh, uh, outreach uh, organizations like Aquaria, like the, the uh, work that's going on at uh, oceanographic institutions around the country, uh, what you can see on the Discovery Channel and so forth, have really heightened people's understanding of the importance of the ocean, the diversity of the ocean, the way the ocean interacts with the, the life that all the rest of us lead, uh, with agriculture and so forth. And our knowledge of the ocean and our appreciation of it will lead us to, uh, to look at all of these, these uh, challenges in a different way, I think. Finally, I'd like to leave you with a thought uh, that comes from one of the foremost ecologists of our time, E.O. Wilson. And he reminded us, all of us who did an experiment with bacteria or other microbes in petri dishes when we were in, in uh, science, and this is looking down on a petri dish with auger. And at some point, uh, a few days before this picture, somebody put a little spot of, of uh, bacteria in the middle of this auger plate. And it probably sat there for several days, right, before anything happened. Didn't do anything, didn't do anything. Then it started growing, and it's spreading out, and it's using the resources. And what E.O. Wilson called our attention to was 
the idea of the finite resources and how quickly you go from something that isn't using all of those resources to something a couple days from this picture where the entire plate is covered with bacteria and they can't live any longer because they've used up all their resources. And he reminds us that we too live in a petri dish, it happens to be 70% ocean, and we need to be very much aware of these big issues that are out there, to be concerned about them, to demand that the, the oceanographic community give us the answers we need to the sustainability of what we're doing because it's so tightly related to our food supply, our agriculture, our climate, our transportation, our way of life that we've developed depending on the ocean as it is today. Thanks a lot. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, could you comment for a moment on the 25 million tons of debris that's supposed to be coming from floating from Japan? to California, and um, if Florida has more land mass, but it'll be uh, impacted economically, it, will the salinate, salination impact the fresh water? Those are the two questions there. Okay. Thank you. The first one was about uh, what many people have called the great garbage patch. Uh, there are actually several places in the ocean, uh, in the the, center, the one that we hear about the most is the center of the North Pacific, but there's also an area in the center of the Atlantic, the South Pacific, and the South Atlantic, uh, where the circular motion of the, the currents uh, of the ocean tend to trap uh, floating things. And uh, there is indeed a lot of plastic floating in the oceans that wasn't there uh, 50 years ago or 100 years ago. Um, you don't have to worry about thinking of an ocean that's plastered with plastic. It's not like that. It's more like uh, here's, here's a piece of floating plastic over here, and there's one over there at the back of the room, and there's one over there. Uh, but it's still, overall, the concentration uh, of plastic is much greater than, uh, than in the past. Two things. First, this is such a huge area of international discussion. There is a whole international uh, organization uh, called the Marine Debris Conference that very actively um, works on the problem of marine debris and how to decrease the amount of plastic and other uh, material that's not biodegradable that goes into the ocean. Uh, so they do that by uh, a great uh, deal of new regulation. The amount uh, of marine debris that's going into the ocean we believe is less than it was 25 years ago. The other thing that's going on is a lot of research into the nature of the plastics. So can you make a plastic such that um, if it's in contact with seawater and sunlight, it breaks down? Uh, so, you know, you're this wouldn't break down because we're not, we're not in salt water. Uh, but as soon as it did go into salt water, that it would break down. So there's a lot of work on that. The second question was about um, uh, salinity and sea level rise. And am I, is that the, OK. So the sea level rise, uh, yes, it would. It, it, decreases the salinity of the ocean a very small amount. Um, so the, the, salinity, um, the salinity during the time that all the glaciers were on land was less than it is today, or that it was during interglacial periods, but it's a very, very small amount. Um, so the big, the big thing that we worry about is not so much that as uh, the impact of uh, changing salinity on uh, 
or the impact of, of saltwater intrusion. Um, okay. Coal-powered power plants. What's the impact of those around the world on CO2 or pollution of the water? Uh, coal, uh, burning of, of coal generates more CO2 per BTU than oil, which generates more per BTU than natural gas. And so for the same amount of energy, coal generates more CO2 in the atmosphere than than oil or natural gas. So there's a lot of talk about, uh, you know, the, especially now that, that we're really explo exploiting a lot of natural gas in the U.S. that, that this will help. The, the big problem with CO2 is that it's a global problem. I mean, we, could, we can do all the shifting we want if, if, uh, if China and India and Indonesia uh, are growing their economies and they're growing their use of energy by using a whole lot more fossil fuel, we still have the problem. So it's, it's a global problem. We're not, we're not going to get out of this problem in two years or five years. I think that's sort of you know, silly to try to think of it that way. I think we have to acknowledge that this is a huge problem that we have to shift uh, you know, our whole energy economy, and that depends on uh, energy sources that are not now uh, as cheap as coal and natural gas and oil. And that means we've got to innovate our way out of it. Time for two more questions. There was one back here. Yes. <clears throat> Uh, Dr. Linen, first I want to thank you for talking me out of buying that short sale condominium in Miami. <laughs> but uh, commensurate with that chart that you were showing earlier, uh, in the state of Florida, the, um, the reclaiming of the river of grass has been a very political uh, issue. And of course, it's extremely complex. It does not move at a very quick pace. And isn't the chart that we looked at um, almost by default, an argument against the process because it's going to take so very long and you're looking at um, within a century to two centuries, that's actually essentially going to become a saltwater estuary. Well, um, it will if, if uh, sea level, if, if we just say, okay, sea, that's it, sea level rise is... is uh, is inevitable, um, and it's certainly a serious problem. I think that uh, there are a couple ways of thinking about that. If you if you say, okay, it, you know, we've been we've been at the Everglades restoration for what maybe 10 ten ish years, right. and we got another ten years. Um, do we want to write off sixty years of um, of cleaner water, uh, more fresh water availability, all the economic growth that comes with that, because even if we knew that in 2100 it was going to be underwater, do we want to write off 50 years of it for our children and our grandchildren? I'm, you know, I, that's a, you know, I, I, no, you're, I, you're asking a legitimate I, question. I defer, I defer I, to you. I'm just saying it's been such a very political question, and it's a very important question mm -hmm. for this, for the entire state of Florida. And I was just wondering, had that argument even been made at this point? It has been made, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I think it, it's only been made very recently because a lot of the sea level rise information is so new. Um, but. I, it's been countered with, you know, well, are you willing to are you willing to write off all the benefit that comes from this? You know, it's sort of like saying, well, you know, my, my house will eventually, my roof will eventually uh, decompose. Do I want to, you know, do I want to re replace it? Well, yeah, I want to live in my house during the intervening time. One more Another question. question. Last um, one. Last one. How about the guy in blue there? Uh, thank you. Are there any lessons that can be learned from the effect of uh, ethanol uh, production on, on, on 
corn, corn crops uh, for with uh, with uh, uh, aqua culture. Um, you know, using soybeans uh, as a food source. What potential secondary and tertiary effects might there be down the road? Is aquaculture, uh, you know, viable as a large food source, or are we just robbing, you know, one source to, to cre- create a less efficient calorie source with with, with fish? Uh, it's a really good question, and I, I think it, it's sort of. Uh, you have to look at what the, what the feedstock cost is of all protein. So if you compare that to pigs or cows, absolutely. It's you know, much, the much more protein per um, pound of food stock, of, of feed. Um, if you compl- compare it to you know, peanuts or you know, soy, no, uh, it's, it's much more, uh, it takes much more energy and much more uh, feed to feed fish than it does to, to use the protein directly. Um, so I guess that, you know, if you, if you said, well, you know, we're really, really constrained right now and, and you know, we have, we have no other choices, would aquaculture be a great solution? No. But we're dealing with reality. You know, there are people out there, they want to eat fish, they're going to eat fish. Wouldn't we rather develop ways that, that would allow them to, uh, to eat fish in a much more sustainable fashion? I, I think so. Thank you.